Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing leukocyte extravasation. Okay, so uh, we have so far discussed um, the beginning of the acute inflammatory response. So we've discussed that um, when a pathogen is within a tissue, it's going to have certain molecules uh, on its surface or secreting certain molecules uh, that uh, are a giveaway sign that this is not a normal cell basically and those molecules are known as pathogen associated molecular patterns or PAMPs okay and these activate pattern recognition receptors or PRRs on the surface of sentinel cells such as dendritic cells resident macrophages and mast cells which are dotted around all of your tissues and these release pro-inflammatory mediators okay and these pro-inflammatory mediators are going to act on uh, the endothelial cells of blood vessels in the local area so I'm just going to have a little bit of a revision of the microvasculature uh, Okay, so in all tissues of the body, you have certain tiny little blood vessels which are supplying the tissue with blood. Okay, so you have tiny little blood vessels known as arterioles. Okay, and I want to stress that arterioles are tiny, tiny little blood vessels. Specifically, we're talking about terminal arterioles, because arterioles kind of uh, covers a broad scope of blood vessels, okay? Whereas we're talking about the arterioles that are just before you split into capillaries, so the last arterioles. Okay, so these are absolutely tiny little blood vessels. These are nothing like the arteries that you learn about in anatomy. That's the macro vasculature, the big vasculature. We're talking about the micro vasculature, the tiny blood vessels. Okay, so you have microvasculature. Okay, so you have uh, this terminal arteriole here and it will break into capillaries, so it branches into capillaries. So here are three capillaries shown here, and these are even smaller little blood vessels. These are often uh, called the business end of the microvasculature. So this is where uh, you're going to get exchange of nutrients and waste products, basically. So where oxygen and carbon dioxide will leave the blood, and, uh, sorry, oxygen and glucose will leave the blood and carbon dioxide will come back into the blood. Okay, so these are the capillaries where uh, normal exchange occurs. Okay, and then the capillaries will reconverge to create a post-capillary venule. Now again, the term venule covers a huge scope of different size blood vessels. So to clarify that you mean the first venule after capillaries, so the absolutely tiny little venules, you can put post-capillary in front of the word venule to clarify that. So this is a post-capillary venule. Now, let's have a little talk about uh, the structure of uh, the blood vessel of these three types of blood vessels. So, terminal arterioles, capillaries, and post-capillary venules. Okay, so let's start with the structure of a terminal arteriole. Okay, so these are bigger than uh, they're bigger than sorry they're bigger than capillaries, and they have m a little layer of smooth muscle cells around them. Okay, but they're still very, very small. So let's draw them here. So here is our endothelial cell. Now it will take multiple endothelial cells to make up the full circumference of a terminal arteriole. Okay, so we'll aim for around five of these going around the whole thing. Okay, so that puts it nicely in scale of how small these are because around five cells five little endothelial cells will make up the full circumference of this blood vessel. So these are tiny little things. They are not big at all. You would not be able to see these. Okay, so here are our five endothelial cells, and I'll just give them all uh, nuclei here. Okay, and then the endothelial cells will be sitting on a basement membrane of collagen, which I'll show here in turquoise. So they're sitting on a basement membrane, which mainly consists of collagen. Collagen is one of the key components. It has other proteins in as well, such as fibrillin and laminins. 
but collagen is the main component and you have many different types of collagen in it so you have collagen 4 making up the lamina densa uh, you have collagen 7 connecting the uh, basal lamina to the reticular lamina uh, and you have uh, collagen 3 in the reticular lamina okay uh, and then underneath the basement membrane you'll then have uh, a layer of smooth muscle cells and this is important now so um, arterioles will around their basement membrane have a layer consisting of smooth muscle cells okay so these smooth muscle cells are arranged in rings so let me show you a ring within this smooth muscle cell layer so here's a single vascular smooth muscle cell and they're connected tip to tip like so okay to make uh, a large ring okay that goes all the way around uh, the lumen of the blood vessel here okay and uh, the significance of this is that if those vascular smooth muscle cells all contract then what will happen is that the length of each vascular smooth muscle cell will decrease and when the length of all these vascular smooth muscle cells decreases, then that will mean that the whole circumference of this ring of vascular smooth muscle cells, and by the way, the abbreviation for vascular smooth muscle cells is to call it a VSMC, like so, vascular smooth muscle cell, okay? So the circumference of this ring of vascular smooth muscle cells will go down if uh, all of the vascular smooth muscle cells contract. So basically, if you imagine this well this is the scenario here you have a ring and now they're all contracting so the circumference is going to decrease and that's obviously going to decrease the diameter because the circumference is equal to pi times the diameter so if you decrease the circumference you decrease the diameter okay and that leads to the constriction of this ring of smooth muscle cells and if you constrict that ring of smooth muscle cells, you'll also constrict the layers within uh, the smooth muscle cell uh, layer, and that will lead to the constriction of the whole arteriole, basically, and the lumen will also constrict, okay? So you'll reduce uh, the diameter of the lumen, and therefore reduce the amount of blood flowing through this terminal arteriole. Okay, so that's the structure of a terminal arteriole. Let's now look at the structure of a capillary. So capillaries are tiny little baby blood vessels. They literally are one cell thick. Their entire um, circumference is made up by a single endothelial cell, shown here. And their entire wall consists merely of an endothelial cell with a basement membrane. Uh, underneath it. So that is the structure of a capillary. Literally, it's an endothelial cell and then with um, a basement membrane underneath. Now, this is perfect for gas exchange and also glucose exchange because it means we don't have many layers uh, to get the oxygen across and the carbon dioxide back across and things like that. Um, and um, it also means that these and these uh, capillaries are also very important in the um, in, in acute inflammatory response because these are the ones where we're going to uh, open up gaps in between them uh, to allow increased vascular permeability and also leukocyte extravasation is going to occur here. But one thing to stress is that this lumen is absolutely tiny. It's barely big enough for a single red blood cell to fit through there. So capillaries are very small blood vessels. Now let's have a look at post-capillary venules. Okay, so these are kind of like, well, they're very like uh, the terminal arterioles, except they don't have the vascular smooth muscle cell there. They're also like big capillaries in that the only two layers that they have are the endothelial cell layer, sitting on a basement membrane basically so their um, vascular well that wall is very very simple and very very thin basically it just has these two layers these endothelial cells sitting on a basement membrane of collagen and this again means that they are perfect targets for the increased vascular permeability that we're going to see uh, within the acute inflammatory response and also leukocyte extravasation Okay, so here is our ring of endothelial cells, and again, it's around the same size as our uh, terminal arteriole. We've got five endothelial cells making up the circumference, and then they're sitting on a basement membrane, which again 
consists mainly of collagen. Okay, and is the support for the endothelial cells, because you have to think, what's holding these endothelial cells up? Why don't they just flop down? Why don't they just fall into the lumen? Well, it's because they're attached by uh, integrins uh, to the laminins of the basement membrane. Okay, so these are the uh, three types of blood vessel that you have within all tissues of the body, and these are going to be the target of these uh, molecules that we have now released from the sentinel cells. So remember, the dendritic cells and resident macrophages both released interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, whilst the mast cells released histamine. Now, histamine is going to act quicker than interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. They're both going to diffuse over to these endothelial cells of these three types of blood vessel, and they're going to cause activation, but they're going to cause different types of activation. So histamine is going to cause what is known as type 1 activation of the endothelial cells. Uh, which occurs within minutes, basically, of uh, the histamine having bound to its H1 receptor on the surface of the endothelial cells. Whereas interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, they cause what's known as type 2 activation of the endothelial cells, which doesn't occur in minutes, it's much slower. It takes hours to occur. Okay, and the reason this one is slower than this one is that type 1 activation doesn't involve any new protein synthesis. Every single protein that you need for type 1 activation is already made and within the endothelial cells, whereas type 2 activation requires uh, the synthesis of a whole new bunch of proteins, and every single action that type 2 activation causes does result, sorry, does uh, require this synthesis of new proteins, which is slow and takes hours, whereas if you've already got the proteins, that can be very, very fast and therefore takes minutes. So we'll start off with type 1 activation, which is going to occur first. Okay, so let's discuss the first thing that type 1 activation is going to result in. So, type 1 activation is going to result in uh, the endothelial cells starting to produce two vasodilatory uh, molecules. So, the first is they're going to start producing prostaglandin I2, which is also known as prostacyclin. Okay? Uh, and this is a powerful vasorelaxant molecule. It causes relaxation of vascular smooth muscle cells. In addition, they're going to start producing nitric oxide, NO, more properly called nitric monoxide, but everyone calls it nitric oxide. Okay, so the type 1 activated endothelial cells are going to produce prostacyclin and nitric oxide. Now, what, where is this going to have effect? Well, it's going to be important in the terminal arterioles, because if these endothelial cells here that have been stimulated by the histamine start producing prostacyclin and nitric oxide, what's going to start happening? Well, uh, this prostacyclin and nitric oxide will go back to the vascular smooth muscle cells, and it will cause relaxation of these vascular smooth muscle cells. And when all of these vascular smooth muscle cells in these rings of vascular smooth muscle cells relax, then their length is all, well, their lengths are all going to get greater, and that will mean that the circumference of the ring goes from being small to being large, okay, so that will cause dilatation of uh, the um, rings of smooth muscle cells, and that will be transferred to the whole blood vessel, so you're going to get vasodilatation. Now, why is that important? Well, um, basically, vasodilatation means that more blood can flow through those vasodilated terminal arterioles, which means that you're going to get uh, more blood coming to the infected tissue. Now, why is that important? Well, remember that the whole point of the acute inflammatory response is to bring troops from the blood in the form of proteins and cells that are going to fight uh, the inflammatory the main infection, basically, the um, pathogen that is infecting our tissue. 
Okay, now if you've got an increased blood flow to that area, then that means that the number of troops that are passing through uh, that area is going to be greater, and therefore your opportunity to recruit troops goes up. Okay, now this increased blood flow manifests um, as redness of the inflamed area, and also uh, it becomes hot to the touch. So if you've ever had uh, you know, well, of course you will have had an inflammatory response that's uh, on your skin somewhere. Then it becomes red initially, and it also becomes hot very, very quickly. Now, uh, these are often pretentiously uh, cited in uh, dead Italian, or Latin, and we call redness rubor, okay? And we, cause, uh, we call um, heat calor. Okay, so rubor refers to the redness that occurs in the inflammation, and calor refers to the uh, heat that you feel of the affected area. Okay, uh, so they are two of the five pillars of inflammation. Okay, and they're caused by this vasodilatation, which occurs very quickly because of type 1 activation of the endothelial cells in the terminal arterioles. Okay, so we'll continue to discuss type 1 activation uh, in the next video.